My name is Commissioner Frank Avila, and the name of the show is The Meaning of Christmas. And we have two ministers that are going to give a sermon on the meaning of Christmas. The first one is Reverend Matt Hoffman of St. Andrew's Lutheran Church and School, Missouri Synod in Park Ridge, Illinois. And the second minister is Reverend Matt Conrad of St. Paul Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod in Skokie, Illinois. And, and Matt, uh, Matt, Reverend, would you like to come up and... Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Uh, Thank you, Frank. Well, I wanted to wish you a Merry Christmas and say it's an honor to be with you and to uh, be greeting you in your home today. As we're celebrating Christmas, we'd like to read the account of the birth of Jesus Christ as it's written in the book of Luke. So from Luke 2, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, that the whole world should be registered. And this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was in the house and in the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and laid him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you great news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. As we celebrate Christmas, I know a lot of us have different traditions that we enjoy. In my family, uh, one of the traditions that we really truly enjoy is that we make a birthday cake for Jesus. And our kids love to sing happy birthday to Jesus and then blow out the candles on the cake. Another tradition, uh, me being a pastor and working on uh, Christmas Eve, uh, instead of making dinner, my wife and I will get Chinese or uh, Indian food to take out and take home, so we really enjoy that. But one of the traditions I had growing up as a little kid uh, was that my family, we would go out and cut down our own Christmas tree, and I have great memories of that. We did that just about every year, except one year, an elderly couple in our congregation, Dick and Emmy, wonderful people, said, you know, we have this pine tree in our yard that's growing up and blocking one of our windows. Would you please come and cut it down? And we, we did that. What we didn't realize until we got home was that this tree had some serious problems. Uh, the, the trunk was about two and a half times bigger than it should have been, and it was a very odd tree to put up. So we went about trying to put this tree up in our house, and we ended up having to bolt it to the wall. And while decorating the tree is so much fun, uh, putting this tree up uh, caused a lot, of, uh, a lot of trouble and a lot of consternation and a lot of pinched fingers and those things. So this was not peace on earth, putting up this tree by any means. So my dad put the tree up, and what we had failed to notice when we were in Dick and Emmy's yard is that the last foot of that tree, instead of going straight up and down, tilted at about a 35 degree angle, and it looked awful. So my dad has one solution when it comes to any problem like this, when it comes to something wrong with a plant, and that is just cut it down, cut it away. 
And so he went without talking to anybody and got a saw out of the garage and cut the top off that tree. So instead of a nice triangle shape, our tree went up and then it looked like a marine reporting for boot camp with a, with a high uh, flat top haircut. So we were laughing hysterically, all of us. My dad decided he'd had enough and went upstairs to, uh, to take a nap. And I remember looking at this tree and my mom grabbing me and saying, Matt, you need to go out into the trash can and get the top of that tree and nail it back on. I was shocked, but I did what she said. She had that look in her eye. I wasn't going to mess with her. So I went right to the garage right to the trash can i took the top of the tree out and i nailed it on and you know what it looked pretty straight i was pretty happy with the work that i did meanwhile my dad uh, getting done with his nap, nap having no idea all that had just gone on came downstairs looked at the tree he walked over to my mom and he put his arm around his wife and, and he looked at the tree and he said see jane it doesn't look that bad it was a wonderful way to start off Christmas. And it wasn't because it was perfect, actually it was a wonderful way to start off Christmas because it was so imperfect. And if you think about it, maybe that's the best way to celebrate Christmas. We've spent so much time trying to make Christmas perfect, having the exact right food and, and trying to make sure everybody's there and, and uh, trying to get the right gifts for people. Sometimes we need to reevaluate and take stock of what is Christmas really all about? You know what? It's not about the right food, and it's not about the right gifts. It's not about any of that stuff. Really, if you want to see a story that's imperfect and really a struggle, you have to think of that first Christmas. You know, Jesus uh, doesn't come to us from, from a, a, a big place. He, he was uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit in this little town called Nazareth, really a, a backwater place, a, a place that nobody really knew much about, a place that's not even mentioned in the Old Testament. It's so small. And he's not born to some princess. He's born to a, a very ordinary woman, a woman named Mary, a young gal who finds herself pregnant with the Christ child. And on top of that, then has to try to explain this to her betrothed, to her fiancé, Joseph, a good, hard-working, blue-collar carpenter who has to wrestle with the idea that this, this girl he's supposed to be married to is now pregnant. And the Lord comes to him in a dream and says, no, this is of me. This is of the Holy Spirit. You have to trust her and trust me. But really, this isn't a fairy tale. No fairy tale would have an eight and a half month pregnant woman riding on a donkey, at least we hope she's riding on a donkey or something, going on an 80 mile treacherous journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem which you read about, it says they want to be registered to their own town. And, and uh, they went from Nazareth to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. They made that journey eight and a half months or maybe more pregnant she is. Can you imagine that? The swollen feet and the pain and the restlessness. Uh, there's not much recorded about the conversations that Mary and Joseph had along the way. And, and maybe that's for good reason. Who knows? And to be frustrated, they're doing all of this simply because a government bureaucrat said, I have to have a census, and so they have to obey. And then we read about the birth. While, while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, and she wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there wasn't any place for them at the inn. Every point along the way of the story, it's not what we would choose. It's not what we would ask for. We don't want our Savior, the King of Kings, to be born and placed into a, a stall where animals eat. How dare there be no room for them at the inn? But this is exactly how it happened. And there's a great blessing in that, actually, because it happened according exactly to God's plan. It wasn't an accident at all that the angels in all their glory appeared to shepherds. Shepherds weren't known for being particularly pious people. Yet God came to them. And what did they see? The glory of God. They got to hear the announcement that Jesus was in fact born and they would find Him wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And maybe part of the reason it was shepherds is because they were actually the ones who would know probably where every manger was in town. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth among those with whom he is pleased. The, the shepherds, 
the people that we wouldn't think would be the first to hear the message are the first to hear this wonderful news. And they say, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's go see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has made known to us. If you really look at it, the story doesn't seem right. But the fact is, it's just right. Jesus, born to an ordinary girl. Stepdad, ordinary guy. Because Jesus came into this world for ordinary people. He's born in this humble place on a bed of straw, and the Messiah came, as we read in Matthew 20, 28. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And ultimately, He came to give His life as a ransom for many. Shepherds of all people, to be the first to proclaim the birth of Christ, our Good Shepherd. Jesus, who came to be a shady place of rest for shady people. Who came to be a hope for undeserving people. Came to be the one who would rescue sinners. Truth is, Jesus didn't come into a perfect world, far from it. But that's exactly why He came. He came into a world full of sinful people, people like me, people like you, people who have a past, people who have secrets, people who have things they're ashamed of. And he said, I came to rescue you, to give you life, to die for your sins, to rise again from the dead. So that's the joy of Christmas. That's really what it's all about. This Christmas, maybe you're struggling. Maybe things aren't going exactly the way you want them to go. Maybe, well, maybe you're feeling the loss of a loved one. Maybe you're just lonely. And maybe you feel like people have forgotten about you. And maybe you're thinking, this isn't how it's supposed to be. Well, let me tell you something. You may be closer to that feeling of the first Christmas than you ever realized. And I want you to remember that the one in that manger, in his perfection, He's the one that came to give you hope and joy and peace, and He did that by dying for your sins. And then He did that on Easter by rising from the dead to say, I love you so much, I'm going to pay for your sins. I'm going to rise from the dead so you know that there'll never be anything that separates you from me, not now, not in eternity. And that's the only thing that that matters. And that's what I learned nailing that top back on that tree that was so messed up. Thank God that Christmas is for messed up people. I take great comfort in that. And I wish you a merry, albeit imperfect Christmas. Amen. At this point, I'd like to invite um, you to to hear my my dear friend and a colleague, uh, Pastor Matt Conrad from St. Paul Lutheran in Skokie. Well, grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. I'd like to, to begin with a little story. This is about a little girl named Susie. And uh, Susie was sitting on her grandpa's lap, and she's rattling off this long list of gifts that she wants for Christmas. And grandpa recognizes that this is a teachable moment. And so he decides he's going to say, you know, honey, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, to which little Susie replied, I know, grandpa, but receiving is good enough for me. See, as we get closer to Christmas, we start to worry about the gifts that we're going to give. And maybe we get a little antsy about all those things. You know, some people even wait until the very last minute to buy all those gifts. And we enjoy finding gifts that fit those people we love, exchanging gifts, receiving gifts. That's always a good time. And at Christmas time, you know, one of the things that people do, even non-Christians, is exchange gifts. But we as Christians exchange gifts, recognizing that we were given a gift on Christmas. It's a remembrance of the very best gift given to us in the birth of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Now, just a a few minutes earlier, you heard read to you uh, a story from the Gospel of Luke. This is one of my family's traditions, is sharing this this Christmas story account, the birth of Christ. It's about 2,500 words. It's very detailed. We love that story. It's got angels and shepherds and and all sorts of things. It's what we make a a Christmas pageant out of. It's a great story. We know it by heart. And I want to share another Christmas story, another version of the Christmas story. This is given to us in the Gospel of John. It's very short. In fact, so short 
that we might miss it if we don't pay attention and listen to it. This is the gospel of, uh, according to John, and this is the Christmas story that we have there. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That's it. Straight and to the point. No angels singing, no inns full of people, no manger, no pregnant Mary and Joseph traveling for a census, no shepherds, none of that stuff. Probably not the best Christmas reading for a pageant for Sunday school. John simply says that Jesus, the Word, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. See, John's emphasizing that God himself became flesh and blood, that God became like one of us in Jesus Christ. We have a special word for that, we churchy word that we use. We call this the incarnation. You might recognize the word carne, flesh. This is God wrapping himself up in our skin to live among us like one of us. You see, it's this great truth that makes Christianity unique. That's what makes Christmas so special. See, all sorts of other religions say you need to do something. You need to work your way up to God. But here, the Christmas story is that God comes down to us. When it comes to that first Christmas morning, God did not remain unapproachable. God was not something that uh, was just up in the heavens that people hoped for. He didn't just speak his laws from on top of a mountain. God came to us. The infinite became an infant. The eternal one became the we one. The alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, came to us as a little baby that first Christmas day. You know, I want you all to think about something. Think about that most perfect gift that someone ever gave you in your family. It could be a Christmas gift. It could be a birthday gift. Can you think about what that is? Maybe sometimes you've got a long list of all those perfect gifts. Now, what was it that made it so special? What was that gift? You know, I remember one gift that I have that I, I'll never forget. It was a wedding gift uh, that uh, my sister gave to me, uh, gave to Danelle and I before we were married. And this gift was wonderful. It was a, a photo album. And in the beginning of this album, it had pictures of my parents, had pictures of them doing things, getting a uh, living life, all before I was even a, a glimmer in their eye. And after that, there are pictures of me, pictures of my baptism, pictures of, of birthdays and family gatherings, pictures of my sister, pictures of my grandparents, all sorts of family memories. Then there were pictures of, of Danelle and I as we were dating, getting ready for life together. Now, what, was made, what made this, uh, this, this gift so great was in the end, towards, you know, this was only halfway filled with pictures. There were places for us to put pictures of our wedding. Later, there were places for us to put pictures of our kids. All sorts of memories that we could continue to add on to this gift. See, the best gifts are like that. My sister knew me so well. She knew exactly what I needed even before I asked for it. I didn't know I needed to ask this gift. And that's what the best gifts do. They celebrate a relationship. That's a reason why a father will have a, a, a picture frame made out of popsicle sticks, painted all sorts of different colors, sitting there next to his computer screen in the office. Because he looks at it and he remembers his daughters, remembers that gift, he remembers that, uh, that relationship he has with them, the time and the energy, all the things that they, they did for that gift. And every time he looks at it, he celebrates again. Christmas gifts can be like that. Gifts that we didn't know we needed. Something we never asked for, but it was the perfect gift. It was exactly what we needed. When a person knows us so well that they give us exactly what we need, even if we don't ask, that's awesome. That's the kind of gift we have at Christmas. God gave us something that we didn't know we needed that we didn't know we should ask for, but God knows us so well that he gave us Jesus. He knew exactly what we needed. See, a long time ago, sin entered into the world through Adam and Eve. And because of sin, all of creation was broken. 
And we struggle because of sin. We struggle with broken relationships. We struggle with getting sick, with getting ill. Sometimes we even struggle with death, whether it's our own or the death of loved ones. Sin ruined everything. We experience that. Sometimes it's hard when we experience that at Christmas. But even because of this great struggle with sin, something else was broken. We're separated from God. There's a broken relationship between mankind and God. But God knew what we needed. He knew exactly how to fix what sin had broken. He knew that he needed to bring us close to him. And so God acted to fix this. And he did that by sending us a gift, the perfect gift. He sent us Jesus. Now, what kind of gift is this? It's God wrapped up in the flesh for us, like one of us. You know, earlier I mentioned that God gave us his presence, that God came down to us. That's what kind of gift this is. This is presence. You know, one of the things that, uh, one of the names we use, the titles we use for Jesus is Emmanuel. We often sing about that before Christmas. O come, O come, Emmanuel. This means God with us. This is God with us. God fulfilling a promise that a virgin shall have a child, a son, and name him Emmanuel. God with us. God also knew we needed something personal. This story about Jesus, this Jesus we read in Scripture, this Jesus proclaimed by angels, was a very real Jesus. This is a real story. God with us, God coming to us as an infant. God's creation. God's uh, creation gets to hold this little baby, God himself, in their hands. See, God knew we needed a personal God. We needed someone to come down, to be like one of us, to save us. It's a personal gift. You know, those gifts we remember, it's those personal things that even down the road we remember, we recall what made that gift so wonderful. God knew exactly what we needed even before we asked. You know, one of my favorite Bible verses, probably one of your favorite ones as well, is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In my church, when we teach this to our Sunday school kids, we say that you can replace the world with your own name. For God so loved you, Matt, that he gave his one and only Son. This is a personal gift. And the last thing that makes this gift so perfect is that it was costly. It was expensive. John 3.16 continues, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Christmas is not the end of God's gift. It's the beginning. The beginning of God making all things new. Just like we heard from my brother Matt, you know, this little baby born at Christmas had a mission. He would grow up, and in 30 years down the road, he would come to accomplish, to bring together all things that he was sent to do. He was going to take place, take our place in life. Where sin causes death, he was going to die our death for us. Where sin ruins relationships, he was going to restore a relationship between us and God. This is the Easter story, that Jesus died, but he didn't stay dead. No, in three days he rose again, so that we will not die eternally, but have an eternal life in him. So when we Christians give gifts to one another, we're doing something that a lot of people do at Christmas. But we recognize that these gifts we give are representing a greater gift, are honoring a greater gift, that gift we have in Jesus. Our gifts can be something that give presence. Presence, not just presence under the tree, but our presence, our time, our energy, spending time with one another. We know that these gifts, too, are personal. They're from the heart. We search hard and long to find those great gifts for one another. And sometimes these gifts are costly, not just expenses in terms of money, but giving of our time, spending time with one another. Gifts like this are hard to find. 
It's risky. It's difficult. But the good news is regardless of what gift you give at Christmas, regardless of what gift you receive on Christmas, you've been given something even greater. 2,000 years ago, God himself came to this earth to be like one of us, to be like one of us to save us. See, it's all rooted in a relationship that God loves us. He loves me. He loves you. And he's going to do whatever he needs to do to save you. So that's what God did. He came down to this earth to save us, to love us. Merry Christmas, everyone. May the gift of God's incarnation, of God giving of himself, bring you great comfort as you celebrate our Savior's birth. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. I invite Pastor Matt to come back forward and, and share a prayer with us. All right. Join me in a prayer. Lord God, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to be our Savior. Lord, thank you that you love us enough to be the perfect gift. And through your death on the cross for our sins, through your rising from the dead, Lord, we know that we are yours. That's a gift that we get. And Lord, help us also to be a gift that we share and tell others that great good news that you came for us. Amen. And Merry Christmas. Amen. Thank you very much uh, for those kind words on the meaning of Christmas, uh, Pastor Hoffman and Pastor Conrad. And I'd like to wish everyone out there a, a Merry Christmas and a safe Christmas.